Hi everyone. In this video, I'm going to walk through how to use GitHub Classroom for Python programming projects in CIS 500. In particular, I'm going to show you how to use GitHub Classroom to set up the Git repository you'll be using, and also how to push changes to that repository and run the automated tests. Now, before I get started, I'm going to assume that you've already installed Python, VS Code, or whatever IDE you prefer to use, and Git on your machine. I'm also going to assume that you set up a GitHub account and created the public-private key pairs that you can use with GitHub so that you don't have to put in your username and password every time you clone or push changes. And of course, to use that public-private key pair, you'll have to have uploaded that public key into your GitHub account. So for this video, I'm going to use the Grand Valley WinLab environment. Now be warned, I am not a Windows user. I know just enough to do this demo here. I primarily work in Mac OS and Linux, but I am going to attempt to do this demo in Windows because my understanding is that most of you will be using Windows, whether it be the Grand Valley Windows infrastructure or your own personal laptops. As with any assignment, your first step in this course is to go to the course webpage and navigate to the timeline and look for the link to the assignment. So here's the link for project one. And in this case, the assignment details are the README of a GitHub repo. And if the assignment uses GitHub Classroom, somewhere near the beginning of the instructions will, will be a URL for GitHub Classroom, like you see here. So start by following the GitHub Classroom link. Now, if you're not currently logged into GitHub, it will ask you to do that. Now, usually you'll already be logged in because Git is something we use quite frequently. And if this is your first time using GitHub Classroom, it's going to ask you to authorize the GitHub Classroom app. Again, this is only going to happen once as well. Usually you'll get redirected to this page here where you can accept the assignment. So click on the accept the assignment button. And then it does take a minute or two for the GitHub scripts to prepare that repo for you. So slowly count to 10, click the refresh button, and you should see a link to what will be your GitHub repo for this project. I want you to notice a couple of things. First, if you look right here, you will see GVSU CIS 500, where you normally would see your own GitHub account name. And that's because you don't own this repository. The CIS 500 organization owns the repository. That's just the logistics of how GitHub Classroom works and how it gets everything set up so that I can help you with your code and we can run the auto grader and stuff like that. The second thing you'll see over here on the right is the, your repository is automatically named. That name is a combination of the assignment name, project one in this case, and then your GitHub name. Or if this were a team project, you would see your team name here. Now, this really isn't going to affect how you interact with your project, other than you won't see this repository on your own GitHub homepage. You'll only see it at GVSU CIS 500 up here. All right, so now you have the repository. What you get with this repository is any instructions I include, like here in the README, and any starter code. So here, if we click on mydate.py, you can see that I put in shells for the functions I want you to write. These shells serve a couple of purposes. One, it provides a place for me to put some additional instructions. You'll see the comments here specifying what each function should do. A little easier than flipping back to the, to the README. And the other thing it does is it allows me to type in the name of the function and the set of parameters. And having me type that in avoids annoying errors where you might misspell a function name or miss a parameter, and then it doesn't play nice with the automated tests and so on. So in most cases, to avoid those annoying bugs, I'll give you those shells. For this project, I also provided a file where you're going to put your test cases and a couple of example test cases just to help you get started. All right, so what do you do next? What you need to do is you need to clone this repository so that you get a copy of it on your local machine. And when you get that local copy, make sure you're using your git clone. 
don't just download these files off the internet because it will be really difficult to then re-upload those changes. You want to be using the Git tool. So if I click on this, the little green arrow on the right side of this code button, make sure you've selected the SSH option in the middle. If you don't, you'll get asked for your username and password all the time. Copy this magic URL to your clipboard, and then you can go over and clone it using Git. All right, so when I use Git, I like to use the command line. That's just what I was taught when I first did that. So I'll come over here, open lab applications, open the CIS folder, and here's the icon for Git Bash. It's another name for Git for Windows, and I'll fire that up. Now, listen carefully. I'm going to do something different than you need to do. I am going to put the project in my desktop folder because some of the other links aren't working quite yet and we're working with IT to get those bugs ironed out. So for purposes of doing this video, I'm going to put the project on the desktop. This will not work in the Windows environment. If you put your project on the desktop, it will eventually disappear. When you're working in Grand Valley's Windows environment, you need to make sure that your projects go in the private data area. But like I said, there's a couple of things not quite working with that yet. All right, so having said that, assuming your Git Bash is set up for the correct directory for your project, which will be different than the desktop, what you'll do is you'll say git clone and then you'll paste that URL from the GitHub web page and clone the project. Now, if you're new to Git, you'll notice when I run the Git clone, what happens is there's a new folder whose name is the same as your GitHub repo. And if I move into that folder, what you'll see is the files that are in the GitHub repo. That's what cloning does. It takes that copy of the repo that's in the cloud and brings it into your machine. Another way to see that would be if I go over to the desktop, we'll see a new folder here that is the name of the project. And in there again is another view of that code. So at this point, we can start the project. So what you want to do is take your IDE of choice. Again, you're welcome to use whatever IDE you're most comfortable with. On Professor Woodring's suggestion, I am going to go to Lab Applications, CIS, and choose PyCharm. And I'm going to select New Project, and then I'm going to set this location to the folder that we just created. So we put that on the desktop, Project 1, Kermit Z. We'll open that. The other important thing to remember in our Windows environment is where it says base interpreter here, you want to select that so we're using Python 3.1.1. Now on your own machine, any version of Python 3 is fine, but you may want to make sure it's not version 2. Some of the things we're covering in class work differently in Python 2. So then I'll hit create and it'll say the directory is not empty. So in this case, we'll create from existing sources. And then when that's all done, what you'll see over here on the left is a folder with the different files in it for the project. This .github workflows and so on, that's auto grading stuff. Please don't mess with anything in there. The virtual environment is to make the terminal work that's built into PyCharm. So I don't think there's anything in there it makes sense to touch. You will just be working with these main files right here. So if we open up mydate.py, again, we've already seen these, but these will be the shells. These will be the, imp these will be the methods you're implementing, the leap year, ordinal date, days elapsed, and so on. The mydate.test is where the test files go. So what you'll, you'll do is you will add more tests. Remember, we're writing tests first with that test-driven development workflow. So what might we do? Let's see, we have for is leap year, we're making sure that 1984 is a leap year, that 1985 is not a leap year. So your basic multiple of four, not a multiple of four. So you'll add more. So I might do something like, oh right, because 
years that are multiples of 100 in general are not leap years. So 1900 is not a leap year. So we want to test to make sure that we know that 1900 is not a leap year. And so after you've written all of your tests, not just the three that are here, but all of your tests, then you'll go and start implementing your, your functions here. So I will do something quick and easy, like is leap year. And so I'll give a naive answer here, right? We say something's a leap year if it's a multiple of four. Obviously, this isn't the complete answer, but it's good enough for this demo. And then you can do things like run the tests. And we see here that our simplistic implementation of only looking at the multiple of four passes the first test because it does say 1984 is a leap year and 1985 is not a leap year, but it fails because it gives the wrong answer for 1900, which is a special case that we haven't written the code for yet. In any case, you'll repeat this process. You'll write your tests, you'll write your code, you'll get your code to pass your tests, and then when you've gotten through all of that, when you've got a complete set of code, a complete set of tests, and your code passing your tests, then what you want to do is you want to push your co local copy of the project back up to the cloud. Actually, you might want to push your local copy of the code to the cloud at the end of every work session, right? That way, especially if you're using your own computer, if your hard drive fails or something like that, then you have an up-to-date copy of your work in the cloud and you haven't lost it. Or if you have questions for me, if you have questions for me and you want me to take a look at your code, the easiest way for me to see your code is to look at the version in the cloud. So for whatever reason, when it's time to push your code into the cloud, you can come down here to the bottom and you can see this terminal tab. So I will open the terminal and you should be in your project here. And so when I want to send my code to the cloud, whether it's complete or not, you can send your code to the cloud whenever you want. It's a three step process. The first step is git add. What that does is it stages your code to be sent to the cloud. It's like make, building a list of all the changes that are going to be sent to the cloud. The second thing you need to do is commit your changes. So you say git commit, and then the dash m parameter is just a message so you can remember what's in each commit. Now, you probably will run into the same thing I ran into. If you're using Git for the first time, it's going to say something to the effect of, you haven't specified your username and email yet. And the instructions for doing that are right here. Now, I will worry about that later. You'll want to do that because once you set it up, it'll be set up for good. Since this is just a demo, I'm not going to set it up because the changes will get overwritten when the machine reboots anyway. Anyway, your third step is git push. And that should send your changes to the cloud. So let me show you what that looks like. So if I do a refresh on my GitHub here, I can see that my last commit was one minute ago. And if I click on, for example, mydate.py, that change I just made is there in the cloud. And the test, we can see that additional test we wrote. Also, if I click over here where it says commits, that string I put in the dash M flag to git commit is what comes up right here. So as you work on your project, you will see that your sequence of commits. Each commit is every time you send that code up to the cloud. And then you can have a brief description of what each step was. If you've just done like an end of day or end of work session commit, then you're good to go. Your, your code's in the cloud. And in case you're wondering, if you ask me to look at your project, I'll be looking at it much the same way I am right here. I'll have a GitHub web page for your project, and then I can click on the different files. When you're done, when you've made that commit, and all of your code is passing your tests, then you want to run the automated tests. And that's here under Actions. So you'll click on the Actions tab. Okay, you have to do this through the web page. 
you'll click on the actions tab and then you'll come down under all workflows to my date check that's just the name i gave for the auto grader for this assignment and then come all the way over to the right where it says wor run workflow run workflow make sure you selected the branch you've been working on i suspect almost all of you will just work on main unless you've used git before and then you'll click run workflow this will launch the auto grader there'll be a little bit of a delay because it's going to queue up the job and now you can see that it comes up and that it's running a little yellow dot there and eventually that yellow dot will start spinning and when the tests are completed you'll either see a green check or if there's a problem you'll see the red x in this case, of course, there's the red X because my code isn't complete yet. And what that means is your code failed at least one of my tests. Now you can click on this to see more details and see where things failed. Sometimes the problem isn't your code and you can see that here. If the problem is your code, you will see the name of the test that failed. Now, since it was my own test that failed, I can see that name is leap year three, right? That was the 1900. And you'll see the same thing if it's your test that failed. If it's the instructor's test that failed, you'll be able to see the name, but the name won't make any sense. So the bottom line is, yes, you can come through here, you can look, you can see what the cause of the failure was. Sometimes that might be helpful if there is a, a problem in the configuration or a network problem, but if it's simply that your code failed one of my tests, you'll see a name that's not going to make any sense. But what that means is you're missing a test. You need to come up with another failing test case. If things go well, then you'll get a green check. And at that point, you'll do one more commit with a message that says grade me in it. And that will be my signal to then look at your completed code that's passing the test. And I can make some style comments on it, or make suggestions of how you might have written the code differently and so on, and then you'll get your, your grade or you'll get an email asking for additional uh, changes if those need to be made. All right, let me do one last thing before we wrap up. I just want to reiterate, when you want to push something to the cloud, either because you're done or simply because you want your local co code in the cloud so it's safe and so I can see it, it's three steps. It's git add, and notice the dot there, and then git commit with a message, some kind of message. If you're using more than one word, that message will have to be in quotation marks. And finally, the last step is git push. You have to remember all three steps. Now, when I use Git, I like to use the terminal. That's just the, the workflow that's comfortable for me. You may have learned Git and learned how to use Git through like a menu in an IDE, and that's completely okay too if that's what you're comfortable with. I'm not familiar with that, so if it gives you trouble, I might not be able to be real helpful, but it is a choice. Just remember the one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to be sending code to and from GitHub through the GitHub web page here. I'm not going to show it to you because I don't want people to do it, but there are ways of uploading and downloading code from the web page. Don't do that. Only send data to and from GitHub through either the command line or your IDE. Okay, so hopefully that is enough information to help you get started and get comfortable with that workflow. As always, if you run into trouble, if you have any questions, please post to Piazza so that I can give some more detailed instructions where those are needed. Have fun.